Thank you for listening to this week's message from Go Church. We hope it encourages you today. For more information about Go Church, check us out online at letsgo.church. We hope you enjoy today's message. I choose. We are talking about making great spirit-led, spirit-empowered decisions. So today I want you to think about your decision-making, the choices that you make. And as we are considering those questions, I want to ask you, how many of you smart, beautiful people have ever been to high school? Can I see? Yeah, yeah? Okay. Almost everybody, we have a lot of students who are actually just graduating from the eighth grade, about to go into high school. There we go. We're going to get a clap for them. (laughs) Kind of in this general area. This general area just got a lot more beautiful and handsome. Our age demographic vastly shifted in the last 30 seconds in this area, which is good. So I want to take you back to my first week of my first year in Sepulpa High School. Now, Sepulpa is in Oklahoma. It's outside of Tulsa. Sepulpa is really the fashion capital of Oklahoma. It's it's unofficial that I... I choose to believe that. So I am, in my freshman year, I am new to the campus, and I want to make an impression, right? Like you guys getting ready to go to Northfield or go to school next year, high school, you want to make a good impression, right? And so I was thinking about what am I going to wear? So I made a decision in Sepulpa, Oklahoma, to go a little, probably looking back, a little too east or west coast, maybe a little too pop culture fashion for Sepulpa, Oklahoma. So at that time, this would have been like early to mid 90s, I decided my first week of my first year of high school to wear extremely large parachute pants. Not like, are those parachute pants? No, the parachutes had parachutes. I mean, big, floofy, poofy, tight on the bottom, zippers, and I thought, man, I'm going to come in and everybody's going to love it. They're going to be like, where did you get those pants? What's your name? You're so stylish. And in fact, I actually have a picture from me in high school with this. This is it right here. I looked a little different back in high school. How many old people like me remember a phone like this? You know the flip like Motorola phones are actually kind of coming back. You got to watch out. They're kind of coming back. Young ones are kind of liking this. So I am there, and I am getting ridiculed. I mean, for me, I'm like, I'm going to every class. It's hammer time. It just is. Oh, oh, oh. (laughs) Bill Carson knows. He knows this. But I got made fun of. I did. I got made fun of. Not everybody loved my pants. My friends made fun of me. I made it through. I survived. Here's the deal. We all graduate from high school, hopefully. But sometimes we never really graduate from this need to be liked, this need to be seen as something, this need to be maybe popular or recognized or affirmed or a part of a specific group. Sometimes we never really graduate from caving into peer pressure, cultural pressure, neighborhood pressure. Pressure that you might feel at work with some of your friends or some of your family. It doesn't matter how old you get. You still deal with this. So I want you to think about this. We probably all have felt this. Maybe you've all had a parachute pant moment in your life. (laughs) I want you to imagine a world. Maybe just close your eyes. Imagine yourself in a world where everyone loves you. I mean, everybody wants to be next to you. The barista loves you. Teachers love you. Coworkers love you. Other people's pets love you. I mean, everywhere you go, everybody just loves being around you. You are popular everywhere you go. Just Imagine what that feels like. Now look at me. I hope it felt good because it's never going to happen. (laughs) 
Welcome to Go Church, where we make you feel great about yourself. This is never going to happen. Why? Because I don't care how hard you work, there's always going to be a parachute pant hater in your life. You think you got it going on? There's always going to be at least one. Hate those dumb. We can't make everybody happy. We try to sometimes, but we can just never do it. Trying to get everyone to like us all the time, trying to win the approval of other people for everything all the time is like climbing and climbing and climbing a mountain that has no summit. It's just a climb. So you're always going to have a parachute pant hater in your life. So maybe we should embrace, I don't know, maybe a teaching from the great philosopher Taylor Swift. What are haters going to do? Haters going to hate, 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 hate. Baby, I'm just going to shake, 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 shake. And now you know you want to finish it, don't you? Let's finish it. We're going to shake it off, shake it off. You wanted to do it, but you didn't. You were almost going to do it, and you were like, eh, let's, let's do it for real. We're going to shake it off. Shake it up. That's good. Look, man, if you can't have fun and go to church, you just can't have fun. We're going to have fun in church today. I promise you that. Haters going to hate, man, and you got to learn how to deal with it. So I want you to think about these questions. Get your communication card. Get ready to write some stuff down. As you're getting ready to be a scribe for your future, think about this. Are we living too much for other people's approval? It doesn't matter how old you are in this place. It's a relevant question. Are we working too hard for the approval of others? Things like, do I fit in? Is my vacation good enough to talk about with my neighbor and their vacation? Is my station in life good enough to be respected or impressive around the people that I do life with? What about my cars? What about my look? What about my general vibe? Is my just general vibe enough to be impressive and people be like, I like this person. The energy is good. I want to be around them. Now, I'm not saying we need to be disliked. That is not the case that I'm trying to make. And I'm not saying that we should offend people for offense sake. No, no. There is a natural offense of the gospel in this culture, but we should never be these people that are like, unless I'm offending you, I don't really love God. I don't think I track really with that. We need to love people, serve people, but if we look to people to ascribe our value, then it changes all the time. Where does it really come from? So I want you to think about these questions. Do I measure up? Am I good enough? Do we post things just to get likes, just to get the little hearts on the gram? Do you like me? Do you like me? Do you like me? Will they like me? Why don't you like me? I'm likable. Are we trying to find too much meaning in what other people think? Write this down. It's our one big thing. This is a choice that I'm challenging you and challenging myself to make. I choose purpose over popularity. I choose purpose over popularity. Author Henry Nouwen is a great author. I encourage you to look at his library, all of the books that he's written. The book that I'm going to reference is The Return of the Prodigal Son. Henry Nouwen, very smart, great writer, and I want to encourage you to put him in your library, put him in your brain. This quote is from that book, The Prodigal. Now, The Prodigal Son, in this book, he reflects on Rembrandt's painting of the prodigal son, and it goes through this journey visually and spiritually and intertwines all this. It's really good, but here's one piece I wanted to share with you today. And fill in this word. The greatest trap in our life is not success, popularity, or power, but self-rejection. On your communication card, there should be, I think, a little blank right there in that quote. Fill that in, self Rejection. I just find that interesting. Think about this. We believe that God is a creator. 
It's true that every person in this room is created in the image of God. And that's such an amazing thing to think about. That's why things like racism, racism is not a skin issue. Racism is a sin issue. No matter where you're from, what you look like, what your station in life is, we are all created in the image of God, and God has described us value. Did you know that God has put things in you that is unique? The blend of everything in you is distinct. If God wanted more of you, maybe he would have cloned you, but he only made one. And you're unique. And to take your uniqueness and to take the thing that God has built into you that's special and then say, well, I'm not going to pay attention to that. I'm not going to think that's important. I'm going to push that to the side so I can blend. Is in a way rejecting not only yourself, but also the way that your creator has created you. So in self-rejection, you're also rejecting some things that God has put in you. So you're saying the creator don't need it. I want to be like this because this way gets me accepted and popular. And I want to ignore maybe some of the things that you've put in me because I want the approval of others. I want you to really think about this. If you get it, it makes you so happy and your awareness of joy goes up. Just think about this. You are created in God's image. When you look in the mirror, in your eyes and into your soul and your personality and what makes you you, God has created you in his image. He has a call for your life, a plan for your life. He's going to give you power to do the things that he's called you to do. He'll never ask you to do anything that you can do on your own, which is amazing because that means each and every one of us have an opportunity to live a God-sized life. More than that, if God has made you in his image, and if you ask the question, where do I get my worth, students, where do I get my worth, my value, where does it come from? If it comes from culture, if it comes from the in crowd, if it comes from your family, if it comes from all these different places, it changes, it goes up and down, and it's not even true. Where do you see your value? Your value is determined. You can even look at basic economics. What is something worth? It's worth what something will pay. What did God pay for your life? Your life and my life is worth the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So we are in this place because of God's goodness. We are here together as family because we have one God, a powerful God that wants to give you and reveal to you purpose. Do you believe that, Go Church? If you do, let's make some noise. If you do, let's say, let's go. If you do, let's say, amen, whatever verb you want. Say, go Nuggets. Tonight, 6 p.m. God sets your worth. Living for the approval of others is like eating food and never feeling full. It just, it's empty. It's empty. So think about this. If we choose purpose over popularity, what does this mean? I want to give you two thoughts on this. We're going to see Jesus in a couple of moments in his life that I think are powerful regarding purpose and the popularity of the crowd. You know, humans are fickle. We change our mind really quick. We're for something and then we're against something. We change our opinions all the time. So we see two powerful examples of Jesus and purpose. Write this down. Here's the first thought I want to share with you. And as we're looking at this, I want us to consider our mission as a church, which is to live local. In fact, let's just say it together. Our mission is to live local, go global. What was that last part? Live like Jesus. Not just know some stuff about Jesus. Not just attend some religious events that talk about Jesus. To actually live, make decisions and choices that are reflective of the truth of Jesus Christ in our life. What we see him doing, we say, I'm going to do that. I'm going to be like that. And we work on that. That's life, man. We're not perfect. I'm not perfect. I make mistakes. You make mistakes. But it is all about when we 
make a mistake, saying, God, forgive me, making it right with the person and moving forward. It's not about perfection. It's about progress. To live like Jesus doesn't mean you have to be a perfect person. There was only one. You're not it. But he will give you the strength and the power to be like him. It's the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. Purpose diminishes distractions. Write this down, the first thought. So let me give you some context for this. Context is used in theological realms as like the big picture you take into consideration, historical context. The context of the story is Jesus teaching. He's teaching probably what is seven to 9,000 people. Men, children, women, families, they're not all accounted for numerically in the scripture, but Jesus is teaching all of them. And if you ever need proof of how good of a teacher Jesus was, they continued to sit and follow and listen even after they ran out of food. You know that it's some good teaching. I mean, I start talking five minutes, it's like, is it lunch yet? I mean, I swear, it's got to be close. Jesus was so good. People were like, food, forgot about it. Food, don't need it. I am not going to miss this. So they're there, and then they're hungry. And Jesus, being awesome, recognizes this. People are hungry. They're about to pass out, all these people. And so Jesus performs this miracle, gets this lunch, and he multiplies this lunch from this little boy and feeds everybody. And it's another example of why Jesus is so awesome, because there's leftovers, a little doggy bag for each person to take home, just more than enough. Here you go, fish fry. So just after that, this happens. John chapter 6, after the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they begin to say, surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. Now pay attention to verse 15. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king, everyone say king, by force, he withdrew again to a mountain by himself. I was trying to think, what would that feel like in our context? It's hard to even imagine. I mean, let's just say for whatever reason, people jumped on your social media, they saw you, and then they started just building up your reputation. And it's like, you are going to be elected president. You don't even have any choice. You didn't even run. You don't even need to run. The popularity and the energy is so thick. It's just, you're on the ballot. You're in. The people are willing this to happen. It's like the only thing I could think about. So if you are maybe Judas or maybe one of the other disciples and your concern is popularity or money or things going well for this Jesus campaign that they might not understand, right here would be the moment like, this is our viral moment, bro. You don't, where are you going to the mountain? Right now is when you get, get this. This is, get everybody in the background, G Jesus, phone, selfie, 5,000 people fed, leftovers, this is the thing that goes viral. But Jesus goes, no. He walks away from the things that we crave. They were wanting to make him king. And he was like, I'm out. And he leaves. And he goes to the mountain to pray. Jesus knew that purpose diminishes distractions. Students, I want you to hear this. Jesus knew that his purpose wasn't to be popular. That's not his purpose. His purpose was to be the savior of all. Sometimes the craving to be liked or to be popular, it kills God's purpose for your life. Because so often I think the craving to be affirmed and to be seen and to be popular and to be loved by all is rooted so many times in fear of people not liking you, insecurity, worried about people not liking you. And so you just change to whoever you want to be around to try to be loved and affirmed all the time, and you end up losing yourself. It's what now and talked about. It's self-rejection. So let's remember the purpose should be chosen over popularity. If you read a pattern throughout the Gospels, you'll see that Jesus made this a habit 
Because it says right here in verse 15, right? It says, he withdrew again. Everybody say again. Meaning not the first time, right? This is not the very first time Jesus did this. There's a pattern in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, of many times when Jesus would do a phenomenal miracle, or Jesus would do something spectacular in a ministry sense, thousands of people, there's all this energy and momentum, then he would withdraw. He would go find a place to be with his father, to be close to him, not to be maybe distracted by all of the ruckus. He say, no, no, I'm going to keep myself on track, on purpose. What does my father want me to do? I'm here to be savior. I'm not here to be popular. I'm here to take the hard road, not the easy popular road. I wonder what he would pray about on the mountain. I don't know. It's not documented. But I imagine it's things like a love for his father. I imagine it's prayers for the people. I imagine it's his heart beating for them and for us. These are the things that I imagine. But to put it in modern day slang, during moments like this, I think Jesus' attitude can be summed up like this. I ain't got time for that. I ain't got time for it. And you have to say ain't. I do not have time for it. It doesn't sound as good. I ain't got time for it. We're going to make you king. I ain't got time for that. I literally don't because that's not my purpose. My purpose is to serve all, be savior of all. I ain't got time for that. So in our life, somebody's trying to drag you in again with their drama, with their problems, with all the whispering. He says, she said, can you believe all this stuff? I ain't got time for that. I'm sorry. It's sideways energy. I've got a purpose. I'm serving God. I'm on a path. I'm on a track. And it doesn't include the gossipy thing. I ain't got time for that. The approval of others. I love you. I'll pray for you. But I'm sorry. I don't have time for that. Gossip. I ain't got time for that. Cultural pressure. I ain't got time for that. Do you like me? 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 I ain't got time for that. God did not create you to be liked. He created you to be loved by him. Let's live, write this down on your communication card. Let's live for an audience of one. Not for an audience of some, and certainly not for an audience of everyone. Let's live for an audience of one, which is, in fact, the only audience you're going to be standing in front of after you live this life. Nobody else is going to be with you meeting before God. Nobody else is going to be standing with you. There's not going to be any crowds bringing signs and all these posts and all these amazing things that you did before God. It's you and him. Live for an audience of one. Choose purpose over popularity. You can't make everyone happy, but you can make one. And in making one, you start to make a difference in many more than one. Second thing, write this down. Purpose empowers me to please God. Purpose empowers me to serve and to please God. In the believer's life, when you say a prayer of faith, when you ask Jesus to forgive your sin, the power of the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of you. The person of the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of you, regenerates you, makes you completely whole and fresh and clean. He, he doesn't make you from good to great. He takes you from death to life. That's what the Holy Spirit does. Life. So the Holy Spirit is in every believer. But that's not where life ends. You don't just pray a prayer and then that's it. It starts a journey. Pressing into the Spirit. Moving more and more into the things of God. Learning more about God through His Word, through prayer, through community. Exploring things like the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Walking in the gifts of the Spirit. I don't think there's anything more relevant or more powerful than real gifts of the Spirit happening. It's always timely. It's always accurate. It's always relevant. And it always gives God glory. And it always builds the community, builds the body. But we can't do that if we 
reduce this spiritual life to, well, I prayed a prayer a long time ago, so I guess I'm good. That's not joyous living in Christ. That's a powerful moment that you're trying to live off of the rest of your life. It's not the end. It's the beginning. So the idea of purpose, pleasing God, it makes a huge difference. So I want us to look at a moment in Jesus' life that I don't really think is talked about that much, but I think you see something deep. See if you can spot it with your smart brain. This is Jesus about to get baptized. This is Matthew chapter 3. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove, alighting on him, and a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. If he would, everyone say that word, pleased. This was at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry. What is God pleased with? That would be like you going to start a brand new job. You go into the job. I mean, it's just like the first, you, you just are there. You just show up. And let's say you're working at Starbucks and you put the apron on. Let's scratch that. Let's go Smoothie King. You're in Smoothie King. You got the apron on, and the manager, supervisor comes over to you and says, I am just, I'm just so amazed. I'm so pleased with how you're doing at this job. And you're like, I, um, I mean, I guess I did tie a good bow in the back. I mean, you haven't done anything. You haven't even completed one shift. Jesus is baptized in water. He's up out of water. Heaven coming down, sky open. I just imagine like the greatest, craziest light show. Dove, a lighting, voice, heaven. This is my son in whom I am pleased. Pleased with what? His ministry resume is blank. All it is is carpenter, family business, great guy. We don't know a lot about the first 30 years. So God is saying, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Pleased with what? He had not raised anybody from the dead. He had not cast demons out of anyone yet. He had not healed leprosy yet. He had not he healed blind eyes, deaf ears. He did none of that. But yet his father is saying, I am pleased with you. Why? I think it's for this reason, because Jesus, before he did anything, he was already a son. If you're a parent here, how, how long do you have to have your kids before you feel like, this is my baby boy, this is my, I'm so proud of them. It's not like you wait until they're driving, oh, I'm just so actually displeased with the way that you ran into the garage, but I still love you. I think he was already a son, and God put this in my heart for somebody here today, and I want you to evaluate your own heart as you hear this. This is somebody here today. You've been trying to win God's approval by good deeds, trying to do the right stuff or perform the right way, trying to do enough good things to be right in the sight of God. Pleasing God doesn't come from what you do for him. It comes from being with him. Stop trying to earn his love. He's never going to love you any more than he loves you right now. Now, for the purpose of God to be made real in your life, that's up to you through the Lord's strength. To be the person that has created you to be, it won't make him love you more but it will change your life. And I think bring a smile to see his plan and his will worked in your life to perfection and give him glory. Some of you, maybe you've been a Christian a long time. You need to stop trying to work for God's love. He already loves you. He already proved it. Now maybe it's up to you to really accept it. 
say, I'm worth being loved. God proved it. What's my worth? It's the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus. That's what I'm worth. I'm worth what every other person is worth in this room. Maybe it's a challenge for you because you not you haven't seen people like that. You see yourself as b- above or better or more valuable in some way. And that's ego and that's pride. And God says that he pushes away the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. He opposes pride, gives grace to humility. Think about this. Jesus, three years of public ministry was built on 30 years of character development. Walking with God, and God was pleased. I think in our culture, in our spiritual walk, we default to doing. We're performance-oriented. We're performance-based. And I'm not saying all that's bad. But when you try to transfer that into spiritual things, it gets short-circuited. When you try to work for God, that turns him into a boss. He's not a boss. He's your father. And some of you need to hear that. You need to just really accept that. He already loves you. But it's in these times that You know, when you're young, students hear me. When you're young, when you're in school, and it's part of life. You're figuring out yourself. You're figuring out your voice and what you're going to stand for and who you are and what you're going to be like. Sometimes you feel a bit unrecognized, like one of the crowd, like it's another student. Or maybe even adults can feel like that. Like maybe you're here and you just had some young kids and, Maybe you used to be physical therapist, used to be teacher, used to be practicing engineer. I used to go and make things. Now I make food for baby. You know, I used to go and be a real change maker at work, and now you just change diapers. And you feel hidden, and you feel like, well, am I like wasting my life doing this little job or wasting my life just taking care of. I love the baby and everything, but I feel like I'm just like a baby care for person. Is this worth it? Is this really it? I want to read a quote from an author that I like. Her name's Alicia Sholey. I had her come and speak at a conference that I was directing many years ago. She has a lot of books, but I like this one a lot. It's called Anonymous, Jesus's Hidden Years and Yours. This is what she writes. In seasons of hiddenness, our sense of value is disrupted, stripped of what others affirmed us to be. In this season, God intends to give us an unshakable identity in Him. That no amount of adoration nor rejection can alter. Maybe we should spend more time focusing on developing our character than developing our business. Developing our character than developing our brand. Developing our character like Jesus did. Basically 90% of his life was character development, three years of ministry. Don't blow off some of these formational years. Maybe, just maybe, the reason that that entity or that brand or that business hasn't taken off or that new thing hasn't taken off yet, maybe your character is not ready for that. Maybe God knows I need you to build a little more, a little deeper. You're not ready for the weight of this yet. Another year of character development and then I'm going to release this. But all the time you're striving like, well, I got to do, I got to do, I got to be successful now. I got to go to the new thing now. I got to get the new title now. Maybe, or maybe you're not quite ready. But God's going to get you ready. Let's choose purpose over popularity today. And let's notice the value of the hidden seasons in our life. You know, we just came out of winter. You drive through the wildlife refuge, the arsenal by a lot of our homes in the winter. 
Well, what's it look like? It looks like it's dead. I mean, this is the only time you'd ever seen it in your whole life. You think, there's, there's nothing. This is just all dead and brown. It's not dead. We all know this. It's dormant. It's a regular season. It's something that's built in and to be expected. So if you are in one of these hidden seasons, maybe it's not an abnormality. Maybe there's not something wrong. Maybe it's a season where you need to remember I still have roots. There's still life in me. Spring's coming. I'm going to bloom, baby. Things are going to happen. But right now, you're in a winter season, and that's okay. Because God's not done with you. You're not hibernating. That tree's still growing. Let your faith still grow. Let's pray. God, help us. Help us. Help me help us to not be so swayed by popular opinion or by culture what our neighbors say or society says or what our market says that we should do or be or spend or do this or do that. God, help us not to crave the doing of the this and that and the other. More than we crave accomplishing your will and your purpose, starting with loving you first. All of our heart, all of our mind, all of our soul, all of our strength, to love our neighbor as ourselves, to see them as equally valuable as us in your eyes. Help us, God, to say no to ego, yes to humility, to embrace your grace, to believe that you truly love us the most that you're going to ever love us right now, today, in this moment. My friends, how tragic would it be if you're in this space right now and you don't make the best decision you'll ever make in your life? To make a decision to ask Jesus to be the Lord and the leader of your life, to forgive your sin. To make a way for you to have a relationship with the Holy God. This is what it's all about. God proved his love for you and for me by sending his one and only son, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ came to this earth. We've read about him. There are witness after witness after witness of his resurrection. He lived a life that we could never live. He paid the bill for our mistakes and our sin with his perfect life on the cross of Calvary. They took his body off of that tree and they put him into a tomb. And everybody said he's dead and he's going to stay dead. And he was there one day, two days, but on the third day a miracle happens. And God resurrects him back to life. And he is here. He is alive. He has a plan for you. And that's to know him, to experience his love and forgiveness, to live the way that he has created you to live. You don't have to be alone in this life. You can be surrounded by hundreds of people and feel alone. There is a hole in our soul that only the gospel can fill. If you're here today and you want to ask Jesus Christ to be the Lord and the leader of your life, I want you to pray this prayer with me out loud. Pray this. Jesus, thank you for speaking to my heart. I ask that you would forgive me of every sin. I'm making you the Lord and the leader of my life. And I'm going to live for you the rest of my days. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks again for listening to this week's message. To stay in the know with Go Church, be sure to follow us on Instagram and Facebook at letsgo.church. You can also download our app from the App Store by searching Go Church. Have a great week and God bless.